it, it depends on the kind of gandhi giri that you are trying to employ um like for example uh, uh, as i said earlier uh, sanjay that movie uh, yeah. on gandhi giri um is no. it one no. thing is that is it admissible is it been you know uh, you know accepted or is it been um, recognized by the system will it recognize see there are many ways of the gandhi giri uh for example like the satyagraha is a part of the gandhi giri social i mean boycott is a form of gandhi giri uh you know uh, uh, withdrawing the taxes uh, to the state is a gandhi giri uh it depends i mean there are many large number as i said earlier as a gene shop said there are nearly 198 forms of gandhi giri in the present context like um, your protest might take a different form like for example in the in the present context even the protest in the social media is a part of the gandhi giri also because you are not visiting there but you are you are registering your protest sitting at home or um, uh, you know uh, the i mean the, the question is that when you are resorting to a strategy uh, you need to have two important uh, understanding one understanding about the 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 nature of the state uh, whether the politics will accept your politics or gandhi giri as such for example uh, uh, i'll give one example in the case of uh, kerala uh, there was a time when uh, uh, people uh, when the, when the, when the poor, you know what's it called the political parties decided to ban uh, the next day after two or three days people themselves decided to what is called another ban it was called the ban against the ban so whether the you know there is a time when the the state also you know reacted similar way uh, but the question is that whether the state is in sympathy with the masses is, is whether the state is in favor of accepting this gandhian strategies as a means of articulation or whether the the politics is prepared to negotiate with the you know uh, gandhi giri as such or not you know gandhi adopted one strategy i, I didn't tell you about that one the strategy was uh pressure compromise pressure strategy pressure compromise pressure you know he exert the pressure the first uh, followed by a compromise gandhi would go for the compromise then again he would uh, resort to pressure this is a kind of circle that he i mean he, he employed uh now the question is that whether the the political activist in the present context will resort to gandhian tactics gandhi gandhi giri also you know uh, embedded in this particular political tactics uh do you resort to the pressure tactics the 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 gandhi giri itself the pressure tactics will you go for the compromise you know most of the time the while in the situation of violence the violent situation uh there is a possibility that the people will withdraw from negotiating withdraw from any kind of compromises but we keep you know pressurizing the system but you know that's the reason why i'm saying that in the context of this violent situation it is not necessary that gandhi giri will be accepted it depends yeah. on the the nature of the state nature of the politics it depends on the the kind of you know actors involved in this gandhi giri look for example there's a time when you can be fooled like what happened in the case of the uh, anna hazare anna hazare anna hazare was the gandhian his movement was anti what's called the corruption finally where is he now use his gandhi giri and ultimately who benefited the political party which is not controlling the power you know as prashant bhushan has said clearly saying that uh, we have been made we have been used for the purpose of the political gain so there is a possibility that the gandhi giri might be appropriated by others by a political regime for its own benefit so it depends on many factors whether the gandhi will triumph or not you might say that gandhi giri will triumph but at the same time gandhi giri may not triumph depending upon the kind of politics if if, if politics thinks that you know gandhi giri is threatening its own existence it tries to divide it it uses it might use all the strategies that kautil employ i mean kautil argued about sama dana beda danda is politics is not so i mean politics is not remaining silent it tries to 
you know, despite the fact that he talks about the Gandhi, he definitely tries to divide the, uh, you know, uh, resistance or the dissenting groups through his own means. It uses this Sama Dana Beda Danda and try to suppress it. And, and may not address the issues. They take the case of what's happening in the case of Narmada Bacha Vandalan. Even after 30 years, they're not got the, the, the troubles are not been properly rehabilitated. Take the case of any other. We take the case of the any struggles in Indian context. Gandhi struggles. Take the case of the ecology movement. How many issues have been addressed? They're not been addressed properly. You know, up till recently, a um, couple of years back, we never had R and R, rehabilitation and the resettlement policy in India. Even though using the, all the Gandhian strategies. So that's the reason why there is a selectivity of appropriating Gandhi. Gandhi was employed by the state because it wants the legitimacy. The politics require Gandhi for its own legitimacy. But for, two, uh, uh, for the state or the politics, Gandhi is an essential thing. Because he would, you know, definitely uh, would create a category who cannot challenge the state. And that's the reason why Gandhi becomes a, you know, he becomes a part of our life. Even though we might say that we are not Gandhian, but in fact, in all practical level, we are all Gandhian. We don't throw stones to anybody. We don't kill anybody. We don't believe in the violence. We are mentally non-violent. We are mentally truthful. So we are, you know, uh, uh, consciously or unconsciously, we have become Gandhian. Everybody is a Gandhian. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is a question from uh, Ali Atisham from uh, Bihar. Please throw some light on the relationship between Mahatma Gandhi and uh, Rabindranath Tagore. Uh, you know, uh, Mahatma was named given by Tagore. You know, uh, both belong to different realm, I would say. Uh, Tagore was basically a taco. He was uh, he's a big zamindar. Came from the uh, Europe, I'm sorry, the Bengal. The zamindar would uh, collect uh, taxes from the uh, tenants and other things. I think between, you know, uh, and uh, Tagore was a, I would say that romantic also. Uh, Tagore was a nationalist also. Uh, Tagore wrote the poem uh, for three countries. Um, but uh, it is said that uh, his two and a half poems have become the national anthems, particularly India, Bangladesh, and uh, I think uh, Sri Lanka or something. I don't remember exactly, whatever it may be. Uh, both belong to the two realm, uh, uh, but there are differences. You know, uh, uh, Tiger would appreciate the Western world, uh, Western civilization, uh, Western taste, and all these things. And that's the reason why Gandhi, he opposed Gandhi at the time, if I'm right, uh, if I'm right, Gandhi, he opposed uh, while Gandhi resorted to uh, what's called the boycott the Western goods and other things. Uh, most important uh, argument that uh, uh, Tagore made was with regard to the nationalism. Uh, that important because you know uh, that has its relevance in the present context as well. Uh, Tagore argues that the uh, extreme nationalism uh, or the love for the nation. Too much of love for the nation is always uh, bad for the country, uh, which is nothing but um, uh, loving too much. I mean, uh, uh, too much of uh, identification with the nation is always dangerous trend uh, for Tago, for the simple reason that uh, that would create the condition for uh, uh, conflict, that would create conditions for uh, uh, hate, intolerance, etc. Because Gandhi believed in the tolerance. Gandhi believed in the pluralism. 
uh, gandhi believed in the what is called the composite culture and the composite nationalism um and uh, but uh, in the debate on the nationalism uh, we don't keep um, uh, tagore out of the uh, realm for the simple reason you know look at for example now i believe that there are four important narratives uh, debates on the nationalism taking place one debate is the the debate on um, one side you have the composite nationalism uh, debate uh, largely came through gandhi nehru azad azad has to be brought in here he, he represented that uh, particular debate uh, the second nationalism that we talk about is uh, uh, the debate uh, of the hindutva uh, which believe in the cultural nationalism which is exclusive nationalism and other things third nationalism is the uh, ambedkarite or the subaltern nationalism um, talking about the nationalism of the people who are not been recognized by in the history uh, who have been marginalized and other things last uh, debate nationalism we talk about is uh, constitutional nationalism particularly after uh, nrc or after caa agitation that uh, went on in indian context uh after particularly uh, during uh, december and uh, uh up till recently february when you look at uh, uh tagore uh, in this particular context can you look at tagore in the composite nationalism uh despite the fact that the uh, tagore had a different opinion about uh, nation and the nationalism he has been incorporated in the composite nationalism Uh, for the simple reason that uh, 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 tagore believed in tagore believed in the celebration of the uh, different cultural practices uh, i would say that uh, shanti niketan for example is experimental lab was not only a lab uh, for the interdisciplinary studies but also it was a kind of celebrating the nationalism they celebrating the multiple cultural practices and 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 the creating what is called the uh, composite culture um uh, you know and at the same time uh, it was not only celebrating but also recognizing the presence of different cultural practices in india that reason why uh, tagore uh, is brought here uh, to understand the uh, composite nation uh, the composite nationalism in india he is not seen as an antagonistic uh the great de- that great debate took place that between gandhi and uh, uh tagore with regard to the nation or the nationalist movement and other things but despite all these things uh tagore has been accommodated Ga- Ga- tagore has been seen as a part of the 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 composite nation as such thank you uh yes sir uh, uh, very nicely you have given an answer professor jayaram Jairam who has some question i think uh, sir you can ask sir jairam oh professor you are here yeah sir uh, you can uh, yeah. may audible yeah yeah sir. yeah yeah okay how, how can i how can i miss uh, sadi's uh, you know lecture he speaks very well i know him for 40 years he did a <laughs> phd in jnu of course i was much senior he went there later uh, uh, sadi sir congratulations wonderful thank you sir uh, in fact before listening to you i listened to uh, you know ramchandra guha uh, you know mm. in a talk uh, organized by deccan herald that was mm-hmm. also good this is equally good <laughs> we, we cannot spend our day uh, better than listening to uh, such illuminating uh, you know personality speaking on gandhi and his relevance thank you mm-hmm. now uh, i have made some observations that is there in the chat box you can look to it sir whenever you have the time now the question i would like to pose right away is uh, in this country uh, you know as you also know uh, gandhi has been appropriated by many people congress party appropriated him more particularly the gandhi uh, nehru family appropriated him now the bjp has misappropriated him but they also say well uh, <laughs> we are related to gandhi and principles but the true uh, you know value of gandhi is something which is not felt by our politicians because their objectives are different their 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 means are different their their goals are different and they are nowhere near uh, gandhi in terms of uh, uh, you know uh, bringing uh, his uh, ideals into practice 
Swaraj, which uh, which Gandhi ji talked of, is what we want. Of course, BJP talks of Atmanirbhar Bharat, but then uh, you know his concept of Swaraj was also based on the other pillars of non-violence and removal of untouchability and so on and so forth, which is missing. Anyway, I don't want to go into that, but I want you a comment on uh, the uh, on the message that you would like to give to the youth, uh, because youth. we like you know and many of us uh, often feel uh, uh, youth are uh, getting drawn towards materialism they have a disdain for politics they have no interest in uh, ideology so they are removed from ideology and things like that so what is the message that you would uh, uh, like to give to the youth on a day like this on the 151st uh, birth anniversary of uh, uh, mahatma gandhi thank you well uh, <laughs> in fact it reminds me about gandhi Uh, somebody asked gandhi what is your message gandhi said uh, my life is my message uh, but in this context my life can be a message uh, for the youth but i think uh, they should reread gandhi for the first of all you know uh, one important thing that's um, quite perplexing in the indian context is that nobody is reading gandhi's hind swaraj it's, it's a matter of 100 pages no less than 100 pages 60 pages i think that has to be read the text because that might you know it has to be introduced right from the first stanza even though you, there are large number of stories about gandhi um why i'm trying to argue about that one is that you need to derive some inspiration from the gandhian concept not as a person gandhi for example is critique on the western civilization the western modernity uh, if they read if they carefully understand they understood that uh, philosophy probably uh, i would say that uh, uh, it will lead to what is called the uh, alternative developmental models which doesn't mean that it's a atmanirbhar you know art in the in the uh, for example in the new education policy there's a term called the skill development program right uh, you might be knowing about it i can't say that uh, skill development was uh, uh, even the bjp might say that it's gandhian Uh, but definitely i would say that uh, gandhi had a different program as such you know when you look at his gandhian education mode or education principle gandhi was a bitter critic of the english education gandhi was in favor of what's called nai talim talim in the the local languages or mother tongue okay gandhi you know stood for uh, education which would combine physical labor with the knowledge with the you know bridging the gap between the state which doesn't mean that it's a skill development uh, gandhi you know in the, in the sense that uh, uh, gandhi's main concept of uh, you know labor was uh, to overcome the caste differences class differences and also to create a category who believes in developing indigenous technology who is employed in the local level and other things what i am trying to say that don't discard gandhi i, I would definitely say all the youths that don't discard gandhi try to identify gandhi in different spheres where is gandhi gandhi for example in the social movement whether gandhi is in the civil society whether gandhi is in the politics you know try to identify gandhi and try to develop an alternative model Uh, uh for example for me uh this what's called the it is shops alternative shops are the most important shops in indian context but i would say that uh, given the uh, shrinking employment opportunities uh shrinking spaces for the youths mm. uh, to get into the politics and other things probably they need to read it gandhi or read gandhi Uh, in a larger context, in the present context, in the context of the capitalist development, others, and try to develop a model uh, which would uh, sustain India's economy, which would sustain the rural economy, you know, rural technology, <laughs> which which would sustain the indigenous uh, technology, indigenous uh, path of development, and other things. but uh, when i am talking about this indigenous alternatives i am not talking in terms of the language that is employed by the you know bjp and others i am talking definitely uh, you know category of the gandhi so my message is that uh, one thing is that we should give up 
uh, what Gandhi said that uh, 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 thinking about violence, uh, you know, the, that's one thing. Uh, the second is that we need to decolonize ourselves, decolonize ourselves uh, uh, to create what's called the alternative development. Third is that uh, we need to, uh, you know, construct ourselves as a new category which believes in uh, ahimsa, which believes in satyagra, which believes in the introspection. Uh, probably we need to create a new category of population in the present context uh, to get away from this materialist world, to get away from the Western modernity. Why don't you have our own modernity, Indian modernity, Gandhi modernity? Why don't you have the you know, Nehruan modernity? Why don't you have the Medkarit modernity? I think we need to have our own modernity, uh, which should be different from the West. It should not be a reactionary modernity. It should not be modernity of the one particular community. It should not be the, the modernity imposed from the communal ideology. It should be secular modernity. It should be the modernity uh, of, of rationalism. Uh, it should be critical. So uh, this should be my message where um, uh, the whole development should be focused from the perspective of the youth also. The state has to change its character as such. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Asadi. Thank you. Hello. Can I ask? Hello. Can I ask a question? Please. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Atasi is out. You are audible. Yeah. So, Professor Asadi Saab, uh, it was such a high level, excellent scholarly cerebral talk. Uh, it's difficult to ask a relevant question. Uh, the level two, you have taken this talk. Uh, um, very good, excellent. Uh, don't you think uh, Gandhi is just an idealist so far as nonviolence is concerned? Uh, many nations, including Western countries and even Western leaders, they consider Gandhi as an icon of nonviolence, but nobody follows him in reality. We are seeing how Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Lebanon, Palestine, all are being bulldozed with uh, brute power. So it is just a question of a strong power versus a weak power. Don't you think Gandhi's theory of nonviolence has just become a fashionable statement, but is not at all practical and nobody follows it in reality? Well, I partly disagree with your argument, but before that, well, thank you very much for your compliments. Uh, <clears throat> why I'm trying to say that um, uh, Gandhi is not very, very idealist uh, in the present context. There are countries which are, even though they may not be talking about Gandhi, but definitely follow Gandhian principles. Take the case of Japan. Uh, Japan has denounced this military position, you know, that it's no more having the military buildup. Or take the case of the Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland doesn't have this uh, army. Or take the case of uh, Scandinavian countries, which is uh, Holland or uh, uh, Sweden or Norway and other countries. For me, uh, these countries become more representative because you know that they are the one uh, which believes in the social democracy, which believes in social welfareism. Uh, uh, which believes in the uh, what is called the uh, inclusive development, not exclusive development. That's the reason why uh, in this particular Scandinavian countries, the uh, social development is very, very high. Uh, when they are, they, they are you see, uh, there are countries which once uh, were the colonial power. Uh, Holland was the colonial power one time. Today, they are not the you know, military powers. They are, they are completely denounced that uh, military objectives. Uh, that, and that's the reason why the argument you might be doing about this particular argument that uh, uh, reduce the uh, budget allocation to the you know, military and transfer that amount to the education. For example, like the whole uh, argument is that uh, we should have minimum 10% of GDP to the education. 
uh, and that uh, helps in the gross enrollment ratio from 26% to the 50%. Uh, if you uh, increase the 10%, uh, which would amount, you know, increasing a literacy rate, uh, which would amount to public consciousness and other things. Whatever, what I'm trying to say that, oh and uh, this, this all started during the uh, Mohan Singh period, but whatever it may be, I would say that there are countries uh, which are directly or indirectly following Gandhian principles of non-violence. Uh, there are rogue countries, you know, what I, I'm sorry to use this term called the rogue. Rogue country is a concept used by the America, United States, uh, castigating uh, Syria, Libya, uh, Iran and other things. Because behind, uh, remember that was, that was not the, you know, suddenly uh, erupted categories. They're all constructed categories and constructed for the political reasons. Why Libya became the victim of uh, uh, war uh, by the United States. Simple fact, because uh, Libya was going for uh, alternate, uh, you know, currency and, and America United States wanted to control the its market, oil market and other things and uh, Gaddafi was coming in the way. Iran, known as the most socialist world, and Iraq, Iraq, for example, in the Iraq, they were all created. You know, the whole argument of um, Huntington, Huntington of class of civilization worked here. And Bush said, whoever, are, whoever is not with us is are against us. That philosophy was used against Afghanistan, against Iraq, against, against Libya, uh, and other countries, Syria today. They, they are completely destroyed this category. I mean, who are the, look at, if you look at the history of ISIS, who are the creator of this flag? You know, if you look at this history, it goes back to the Mujahideen's movement in Afghanistan. Mujahideen became, you know, Taliban's. Taliban became ISS. Who supported this one? First, the first Mujahideens. It was the American forces that supported. And, and they were the creation of the, you know, what's called the Cold War between Soviet Union and the United States. It is not, they themselves became Taliban's. I remember that the conditions when the United States occupied these countries, when the United States, uh, you know, uh, appropriated the natural resources of this country, where, uh, and, and, and this, this kind of uh, you know, descending forces emerged. What I'm trying to say that, look at, uh, uh, one side you have this castigating of these countries as a rogue state. They were made rogue, they were politically constructed, they were constructed for the benefit of the United States or the Western world. I'm not criticizing the United States, but it's a fact, that's a well-known fact that it was a construction of the West. But the thing is, uh, uh, given the fact that uh, whether the uh, rogue state can be uh, tamed or, 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 or try to be converted into a pacifist state or they can be converted into what's called the non-violent state. Given the, the present context, it is so difficult in this, uh, I would say that area of conflict, like Afghan, Afghanistan, it's slightly difficult. But in other pockets, I mean, the, 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 it depends on certain factors. One is that the factor, uh, look at in the uh, Latin America. La Latin America, none of the countries, uh, they have abused this violence. You know, they believed in the, uh, you know, the, the, not only abused, but also the, uh, the fact is that uh, the conditions have again, again created uh, where the violence becomes a fact. Violence becomes a recurring phenomena in the, the Latin American context. Uh, Linda was killed, uh, you know, she, she, you know uh, Yodhi Che Guevara was also killed. Uh, there was an attempt to, on the life of uh, Cuba or, or attempt to the life of um, Fidel Castro not less than 54 times. Um, you know, uh, th these things happen in the context of America, in Latin America. And, and mainly because, you know, that. Uh, the Lutifandias, big estates are controlled by the American companies. The local natural resources are being controlled by the American companies. Uh, that's the reason we have got the Chiapas movement taking place. Uh, I'll take the case of uh, you know, other parts of the world. Africa, Africa where you have this ethnic conflict. It is not the religious conflict. Ethnic conflict is the most 
you know, strong in the African context. In the, where, 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 where the poverty level is very high, where the uneven development is very, very much sharp, where, uh, you know, uh, the death rate is, and, and undernourishment is also very high. In that context, how do you expect the, what's called the, uh, the peace emerging? How do you expect the people, the countries giving up uh, the, what's called the non I mean, giving up the violence? You know, in a, in, a, in a African continent, whatever the aid comes to that country, it is used for the military expenses, purchasing the military. Because, you know, uh, more the conflict, more is the benefit for the United States. Because the America, you have this military and the industry complex operating. We might be knowing about it. If there's any, any, any conflict in the Middle East, it will definitely help in the demand for the military equipments which will create job market in the United States. The, you know, in the, in the, the nexus between the military and industrial complexes, you need to understand. So uh, that's the reason why this is a popular argument, why America did not kill you know, uh, Osama for many years, but this is a simple reason. If he had been killed right from the beginning itself, immediately after the invasion of uh, Afghanistan, their policy would have come to an end. They would not have been able to sell the, you know, equipment to Israel or to the Kuwait or, or any other country. They, they, their job market would have come down definitely. So they, they prefer to have the world conflict, conflict in different parts of the world. Even though, you know, America says that America is the, one, the greatest democratic country in the world. But it's also true that it is the most authoritarian state also. It is the most liberal fascist state also. It's the most surveillance state also. Everybody is, is, is in a, you know, there's a spies, you know, everybody is, you know, under watch in the United States and outside. So a, a democratic structure, but operate as a, dem, you know, non-democratic way. How do you expect the, the uh, peace to emerge in this contradictory position? How do you expect the, the uh, non-violence as a principle of the state policy emerging when it has a multiple policies, when it, is, it has got a contradictory policies at the global level. You cannot tame America. You cannot tame Syria. You cannot tame even Libya also, where the, the tribal conflict is sharp now. Can you tame India also? I doubt, despite the fact that we, we watch for the non-violence, we recognize the icon of Gandhi as a state icon, but it is also a powerful state. What I'm saying that we, you know, deliberately kept, I mean, Gandhi is an icon, we require that one. And that's the reason why we have not been able to remove Gandhi from the notes, 100 rupees note. We have got a multiple Gandhi, you know that, colorful Gandhi in the notes. Pink Gandhi, green Gandhi, yellow Gandhi, blue Gandhi, it's a multiple Gandhi that we have got as the notes represent. And that, that colorful is the colorful nature of the state. Nature looks at Gandhi differently. So you have the Gandhi of you know, blue Gandhi, the green Gandhi, yellow Gandhi, uh, and, and red Gandhi, all kinds of Gandhi. For us, Gandhi is required. But we also talk about the non-violence. But I would say that state, it's difficult to tame the no, in a violent state and convert them into non-violent. But there are states which have tremendously done changes. Scandinavian countries, take the case of uh, Switzerland or take the case of the Japan. I think, I mean, Japan was, uh, you know, in 1980s, if I'm right, which was posed as emerging superpower. You can imagine it was emerging without, without the, you know, I mean, without establishing a military base for itself. We can be a superpower, adopt the nonviolence, reduce the military forces, or, or completely eliminate the, give up the war. We can be a power. And at the same time, we can have a state which provide all the facility or all what is called the, uh, increase the social development of the people. The best possible thing is in Norway, Sweden, and other countries in the European continent. Two things is possible, but I'm, I'm not confident about the United States or the American continent 
the England or the Germany and France, uh, because they are the allies always um, of the United States or the NATO power. So they they always uh, go for the violence. They always resort to the violence, saying that the world peace can come back. Use the violence to bring the peace. I I think that is a paradoxical position they are in. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwin Tap, for your question. Uh, we are running short of time. We have got last question. Uh, if any of the questions are there, we'll be posting it to the speaker and uh, we'll provide it the answer to the text. Uh, I invite Sajjad Ahmad Sahab uh, uh, to, uh, to present his question. Uh, so, yes, Sajjad Sahab, you can unmute and you can ask. Yeah, yeah, no, there is some. Uh, a power problem here. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm shifting to some other phone. Yeah. There is a power outage here. Yes, sir. You can, your voice is audible. You can question, sir. Uh, uh, at the outset, I would like to uh, congratulate and thank Professor Asadi for delivering this very scholastic and durated lecture. It was full of uh, information and presented a very comprehensive view about uh, how to, uh, you know, uh, fix uh, Gandhism uh, values in the present context. And of course, he gave a very global scenario, not merely confining to the Indian context. But uh, uh, one thing, uh, you know, this morning, I mean, this afternoon, I came halfway through. Uh, a, uh, uh, I mean, a Zoom meeting uh, being, uh, you know, addressed by uh, Professor Asadi's uh, very good uh, friend, uh, Professor Purushottam Bili Malay of the Jawaharlal Nehru University in Vachana Mantapa. It, it was a Zoom meeting in Canada. I had to, you know, uh, uh, I mean, come away halfway through to attend to uh, Professor Asadi's uh, you know, lecture and uh, uh, really has uh, uh, given a very uh, important insights. But one question I would like to uh, ask uh, Professor Asadi that, uh, you know, out of uh, several, uh, you know, Gandhian influences, you know, uh, very less is, uh, you know, emphasized about Gandhi's influence of Islamic uh, ethos and Islamic history. Perhaps uh, we are uh, somewhat uh, uh, in a mode of inferiority complex because Gandhi ji in his several uh, writings in Harijan and in uh, other you know, articles has uh, you know, eulogized uh, the role of uh, you know, Islamic, uh, the caliphs, uh, uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq uh, and Umar Razila Kala. And uh, since uh, uh, Professor Asadi is a, a well-known authority who has uh, written eminently on the question of identity, religious identity and minority identity in the context of the Indian scenario, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, request him to shed some light so that this affinity between our ethos, Islamic uh, ethos, and the Gandhian principles should be, you know, strengthened and uh, developed further, so that we, in the in the present context, we as uh, Muslim citizens, we have been relegated to a sort of a second, uh, uh, you know, second or maybe tomorrow, uh, non non citizen type of uh, you know hapless uh, status. So we have to, uh, I mean, uh, regain our own uh, identity in uh, sublimation with uh, Mahatma Gandhi's ideas. I mean, I think that was the refrain, you know, which was uh, uh, employed by Malana Abul Kalam Azad. And uh, if, we, if, if we go further deep, Sir Sayed's uh, ideals were also there, which were further incorporated in the Jamia Millia Nai Talim scheme, which was you know referred to by Professor Asadi. It was really a wonderful talk, and I think it opened up you know 
many 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 stars of uh, thought gandhian thought from which we were uh, i mean uh, not so uh, much acquainted thank you very much i, uh, I uh, yeah uh, thank you sir uh, yeah, uh, in fact sajjad uncle used to discuss with me every now and then about large number of issues uh, literally is my mentor uh, on many issues um, let me look at gandhi as trying to recapitulate gandhi's argument about the islam uh, gandhi did uh, make reference to uh, hazrat umar and the other one uh, i forgot his name um, you know when well, he was making a reference to two caliphs uh, the first uh, third and the fourth one uh, the argument um, uh, gandhi made was that uh, despite the fact that hazrat umar uh was so rich in the sense that uh, he had a vast empire uh, under his control uh but he never used a single paisa from the public exchequer uh he said that how uh, uh these two uh, caliphs they were simple they had a very simple life uh and that's the reason why gandhi would say that we should derive inspiration from their lifestyles leaving simplicity uh leaving uh, uh i think gandhi borrowed this idea of uh, trusty uh, because you know hazrat umar uh, would control the uh, exchequer uh, this is you know, this is reflecting aurangzeb also you know one of the important argument about the aurangzeb is that aurangzeb even though he was the badshah of the country he never used a single paisa from his pocket sorry from the uh, exchequer from the treasury uh just before his death he wrote his will saying that uh, the, he uh, I'll, let me get back to that one and then i'll come back here because aurangzeb how he has been portrayed and uh, what the last will that he wrote in the last will there's an interesting observation saying that he wrote a letter a will in that will he says that uh, uh, i have collected money after uh, reproducing the uh, what's the verses of the quran Okay, as uh, as sold that uh, versus in the market, I uh, got this much of money, two thousand dirhams or something, uh, with this particular person. Uh, ask him to uh, give, I mean, collect that money from this particular person who was his servant, and to bring by coffin for my uh, body. Oh. Okay. The second he said that I have. Uh, uh, i have done some other work i don't know with needle work something uh, i have collected so much of money and it is also deposited with some person ask uh, collect that money and distribute that money among the poor after my death you know it was so simple uh, he never used the money uh, gandhi quotes here gandhi argues that um, both never use that public money for the purpose their own purpose their personal purpose they use that money as a trust i don't know whether that uh, argument of trusteeship and the argument of uh, this trust uh, they came together or they are colliding or they are overlapping or not i don't know i have not done much work on that one uh, definitely borrowed some of the ideas of the islam for example the argument about the hijrat um, that's uh, uh after the khilafat khilafat movement you know that uh, you had this argument of maulana talking about the hijrat and um, gandhi decided with one particular thing let me go back to that's my research i did it in russia uh, a couple of muslims uh, went to uh, what's it called the tashkent and um, gandhi and and these muslims uh, along with the emin roy a marxist uh, they want to wage a war uh, i mean they they had all the preparation preparedness and other things but they could not able to do that one but here gandhi agreed to the hijrat i mean they left india and moved to um, because you know they believed that uh, uh, islam cannot be uh, where, where, where the enemy state Uh, probably this debate started much earlier for example in 1884 uh, if you read uh, uh, hutton's report on um, 
uh, Wahhabi movement and other things, you'll come across why uh, 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 the whole debate taking place, whether what would be the role of Muslims in uh, Darul Arab, uh, the, the country of enemies, whether they should participate or they should confront or they should uh, you know, live together. Uh, but uh, the hijrat was seen as a, you know, uh, not the textual analysis, but as a strategy to non-cooperate with the state. Um, Gandhi had this particular, uh, would support that kind of hijrat, I, I think if I'm right. Uh, Gandhi would advocate uh, bhaichara between the Muslims and the Hindus. Uh, uh, but there are certain companies that uh, one can find in uh, uh, Islam and the uh, Gandhian principles. One is the truth. Uh, the second, uh, one is the first truth. The Gandhi, you know, stood for the truth. The uh, the second, um, uh, you know, in, 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 in at the same time, it reminds me about uh, how Gandhi uh, stood for the cases of the minorities in Indian context, particularly in the context of uh, the food, uh, whether the beef should be eaten should be allowed to be eaten by the minorities or not. Gandhi would say that, no, um, I, I'll not oppose the minorities uh, when it comes to the question of the life. You know, beef eating is the, uh, when it becomes a part of your life practices, Gandhi would say that definitely, no, I'm not going to uh, come in the way in this particular issue for the beef eating. Uh, but uh, truth was one of the factors that was employed in Gandhi, but that can be negotiated. Um, and uh, uh, his argument of uh, uh, distributive justice, uh, Islam does believe in that, right? distributive justice, whether through the zakat or uh, uh, distributive justice in terms of, uh, you know, uh, distributing the uh, one part of your uh, property or the earnings uh, to the poor and the needy and other things. Most important thing is that recognizing the unrecognized, Gandhi did it. Gandhi said that uh, the, uh, one should recognize the last man uh, which constitute the Sarvodaya. Islam does believe in that one. Uh, Islam believes in perfect equality. There is absolutely no differences between the man from a rich community and the common man. For, uh, in, in, in a community life, community uh, you know, gathering, everybody is equal. For Gandhi, Gandhi believed in that, and, and most important thing is Gandhi believed in the recognizing the non-recognized, unrecognized, whether the subaltern, Dalis, minorities, women, tribals, and other things. Gandhi recognized. Islam does recognize, beginning with the uh, 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 Hazrat, uh, what's his name, uh, who was a slave, you know, uh, who gave the first azam, um, uh, and and he was a black. You know, that, was a, uh, that signifies the, the recognition of the Islam of the, the blacks, uh, Negroes, uh, you know, uh, slaves, uh, completely unrecognized categories. Probably that's the beginning of the change. I mean, it has to bring the, you know, uh, those who are not being included. I mean, Islam becomes an inclusive religion. Uh, you know, if you look at Gandhian politics also, Gandhian politics is also inclusive politics. You know, if you look at the Indian history, Indian Congress, between 1885 to 1920, it was largely urban, middle class, cosmopolitan, centric, you know, Congress. After Gandhi became uh, the leader of the nationalist movement, even though Gandhi undertook very few moments, uh, you know, no cooperation, salt, salt, satyagra, and other things, quit India movement. You know, it's very, very few. But Gandhi could be able to bring a kind of you know, completely a change, a, it brought a paradigm shift in Indian politics itself. You know, Gandhian politics become more inclusive. You know, by 1940, uh, everybody, uh, poor men, women, uh, Dalis, tribals, Name anybody, minorities, everybody became part of the nationalist movement. What I'm trying to say is that Islam believed in the inclusiveness, everybody, and recognizing, most important thing is that it is not simply the inclusiveness, but also recognizing the unrecognized. Gandhi believed in the same kind. Gandhian politics believed in the recognizing the unrecognized, the ultimate, the most 
the disadvantaged person to be recognized and brought into the mainstream of, of politics or, or to the religion. And, and, and also believing in the equity. Gandhi believed in the social equity and, and uh, Islam believes in the social equity. I think there are, I mean, uh, possibilities of negotiating between the Gandhi and uh, uh, Islam. Uh, at the same time, we should also recognize the fact that it was Gandhi who recognized the people like, uh, you know, uh, Yusuf Marali, who recognized people like Maulana Azad, Maulana Azad, uh, people like, um, you know, there are many people that who recognized by Gandhi, including a women nationalist leader, women Muslim leaders. So Gandhi's contribution to the Islam or the Muslim as a community uh, you know, is much more, it's great. I'm, I'm definitely say that. Uh, and um, he, he stood for the minorities as such, which ultimately uh, created heartburn among the others. That's a different matter altogether. But I believe that there are points wherein we can have the negotiation between Gandhi and the Islam. Gandhi and the Muslims. Muslim as a community, Islam as a religion. So, I mean, you need to demarcate between these two, Islam as a religion and the Muslim as a community. Because um, minority as the community is a diversified community. Islam as a homogeneous, believe in the one text, one prophet. Muslim as a community, diverse cultural practices, diverse identities, diverse you know, lifestyles, a diverse perspective to the life and other things. So we need to bring these two categories, like Muslims as a category, a diverse category, and the Islam as a homogeneous category, and Gandhi should negotiate. Thank you, there's a possibility. Uh, we are running short of time. We have, we have come to the end of this today's lecture, and uh, before we end, I invite uh, uh, Shafi Ahmed Sahab to propose the vote of thanks. You have to unmute uh, Shafi Sahab. Unmute. Hello. Yes, sir. Hi, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the uh, conclusion of this webinar, beautiful, uh, very informative webinar. I, on behalf of Humble Intellectuals Group, extend a very hearty word of thanks to all our honorable participants who attended this program in spite of their uh, busy schedule and took valuable time. I, I must mention here uh, our uh, deep sense of uh, thanks to Professor Muzaffar Azadi Saab for inspiring us with his uh, talk and excellent coverage. I especially liked Professor Saab where he mentioned that Gandhiji is to be retrieved to, uh, uh, to expand democracy. On the way, he explained the topics exemplary good. And ultimately, see Gandhi has actually become more pertinent in the 21st century. He built us to us three guiding principles. There is Ahimsa, Ahimsa or nonviolence, uh, Satyagraha are the force born out of truth and uh, Sarvodaya or upliftment of the poor. So thank you one and all and to be a part of our uh, uh, this informative and very educative program where uh, our enlightened uh, uh, professor sub uh, had a very uh, detailed and a very uh, informative talk. I thank uh, professor sub especially and all the participants uh, for uh, this webinar. So thank you. Thank you.